President Kennedy valued his Irish heritage greatly, and the Kennedy family's long-standing commitment to building a stronger relationship between the United States and their ancestral homeland makes us especially pleased to host this evening's exploration of John Hume's work during the centennial anniversary of, uh, excuse me, centennial anniversary year of President Kennedy's birth. I've said that all year long, and I, I don't know why I stumble over it. I am delighted to introduce the participants in tonight's program. We are pleased to welcome filmmaker, writer, and lecturer Maurice Fitzpatrick, whose new documentary, In the Name of Peace, John Hume in America, you will view in just a few minutes. We're also honored to welcome Senator George Mitchell, whose distinguished and varied career in public service included his key role as the independent chairman of the Northern Ireland Peace Talks from 1996 to 2000. Senator, thank you for adding your insights to tonight's discussion. It's always a pleasure to welcome Kevin Cullen, the Pulitzer Prize winning jur journalist who has written for the Boston Globe since 1985 and who spent more than 20 years covering the conflict in Northern Ireland to moderate tonight's discussion. We look forward to a robust question and answer period following the discussion, and when Q&A starts, we will invite you to proceed to the microphones in the aisles to ask your questions. If you are in overflow seating at the library but have a question, our staff can help you proceed to the main hall to reach those microphones at that time. Finally, I am now honored to welcome Senator Paul G. Kirk, Jr. As the longtime chairman of the Kennedy Library Foundation, Paul has been a great friend to the library and provided welcome support to its mission. Paul? Thank you, Jamie, and uh, thanks to you and Stephen Rothstein for the daily quality leadership you bring to this library and to its foundation. Good evening to all of you. It's an honor to be invited back to introduce this special event. And my special thanks to my friend George Mitchell for participating this evening. He was, as Jamie mentioned, the brilliant negotiator of the Good Friday Agreement and stood on this very stage with John Hume and seven political leaders from Northern Ireland to receive the John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award in 1998, and we're delighted you're back with us tonight, George. <laughs> Kevin Cullen, whom I call the conscience columnist for his uh, uncanny ability to salute patriotism, expose injustice, and honor otherwise unsung heroes of our community. And in two weeks, Kevin will receive the Boston Irish Honors Award of 2017. Congratulations, Kevin. Well deserved. I will welcome, of course, our producer, uh, Morris Fitzpatrick, but I will reserve that for the conclusion of my remarks. And we are obviously honored to have members of the Hume family with us this evening. The significance of this screening at this venue, our nation's <clears throat> memorial to the first Irish Catholic president of the United States, a son of Boston, speaks powerfully for itself. But it takes on added meaning once you understand and appreciate this library's core mission. It is dedicated, and I quote, to all those who, through the art of politics, seek a new and better world, close quote. <clears throat> of the many gifts we've received from our Irish heritage, it can be fairly argued that the art of politics may just be the most valuable. And tonight's production supports that argument. John Hume, thought leader and moral leader, political visionary and practitioner, understood the deep bond between Irish Americans and their homeland. 
he appreciated more than the most that the troubles of Northern Ireland were our troubles as well. The violence seemed endless, the killings senseless. And even as funds from sympathetic Irish Americans flowed to supply arms and ammunition for the oppressed Catholic minority in the North, John Hume had an alternative vision. He imagined Irish Americans' loyalty and influence being used instead to convert decades of hatred, bloodshed, and heartache to a future of hopeful opportunities, of jobs, of justice, and peace. Through nonviolence, reasoned dialogue, economic development, and the art of politics. It happened that two of our country's most recognized and powerful political figures were Bostonians of Irish descent. Senator Ted Kennedy and Speaker Tip O'Neill came to trust the former school teacher of Derry implicitly, and they became impact players in his nonviolent quest for peace and human rights. The Speaker and the Senator built coalitions in the House and Senate. They influenced three successive presidents to take an active and continuing role in the dialogue, and Senator Kennedy's sister, Jean Smith, was appointed U.S. Ambassador to Ireland. They put their staffs to work on the Irish question. And Gail and I, Kerry Parker, Eddie Martin, and later Nancy Sonnenberg and Trina Vargo came to love John Hume as a human being and as a political hero. And in Speaker O'Neill's office, Kirk O'Donnell, Christine Sullivan Daly, and Tip's other staffers and all his family feel the same way. And from this neighborhood, Mayor Ray Flynn, Steve Coyle, UMass Boston's Patrick O'Malley, Michael Donlan, the Cullinanes, the Dohertys, the Learys, the Costellos, the Forys, the Bretts, and so many others here, countless in number, who became John Stallworth supporters and friends. As I think of it, Morris, it may not be too late to change that title. John Hume in Boston, in the name of peace, has a truthful ring to it. At a time when our own politics are in a state of disrepair and disrespect, tonight's documentary offers a timely and powerful lesson and inspiration from one politician whose vision, credibility, perseverance, and diplomacy, combined with the courage to compromise and to persuade others to do the same, transformed his homeland, the island we love so well, from an armed battleground of civil war to a more peaceful, civil, and just society. John Hume's tireless work gives true meaning to John Kennedy's timeless words. Each individual can make a difference, and all of us must try. The art of politics practiced honorably, honorably is the noblest of callings. Ask what you can do for your country, and not least, here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. These truths are always worth remembering as we reflect on our own citizenship. And now for his contribution through the arts to a powerful documentary of a critical chapter in Irish-American history. I ask you to join me in a Kennedy Library Boston Irish greeting of welcome and appreciation to our producer, Morris Fitzpatrick. Thank you so much, everyone. It's a great, great pleasure. I would 
Second, all the thanks to everyone, and uh, I think it's particularly special and truly an honour to be in this place with, uh, when we think about the Kennedy family, the Hume family here, and the O'Neill family, and so many others who have done so much for peace in Ireland, for a new political reality in Ireland. It's, it's truly special for me to be here. Um, my role at this juncture, at the start, is simply to introduce the film uh, in this particular way. Because we have a panel discussion later, it was viewed that we would uh, we'd play 70 minutes of the film. So the film is slightly truncated on it. I'd just like to bring you up to where we are in the film when, when it starts. John Hume, of course, began his public life uh, not in politics per se, he was a school teacher, as Senator Kirk rightly said, and uh, a businessman in Derry. He was president of the Irish um, League of Credit Union and uh, active in so many ways in trying to form a new consciousness, new horizons for the people of Northern Ireland and of Derry. Ultimately, he saw that given the political structure of the Northern Irish state, there was only one real way to change things, and that was through politics, through getting involved, get, becoming an elected representative. Certainly, he had a civil rights uh, dimension. He was a leader of civil rights in Derry, famously. But in tandem with that, he went to the no uh, Northern Irish uh, Parliament, Parliament of Northern Ireland, and put forward very sane, very serious proposals for, for an alternative society. It's often said that John Hume is the Martin Luther King of the Irish conflict. Um, Bill Clinton, in fact, President Bill Clinton has said this in this film. And I would suggest to you that that's partly why he was, I mean, I agree with it, and I think that's partly why he was. He married this constitutional approach with a distinct feeling of the people on the street, the people who were determined to campaign for change and he brought together so many skills that he emerged as the clear leader, in, both in Derry, in Northern Ireland, and, and in all of Ireland. In this film so far, what we have is John Hume's thesis being sort of, his thesis being nailed to the mast. Uh, in a couple of articles he wrote in, the in 1964 in the Irish Times, in which he outlined his view of how a new society could be created in Northern Ireland through work, through partnership, through dialogue. And I suppose when I started to make the film, those articles were extremely important to me because when viewed historically, as, as they can be right now, they were extraordinarily prescient. When you consider where the, the final deal lay in the Good Friday Agreement, John Hume had, had set out very, very clearly in, in 1964 where the end game was for Northern Ireland. Um, and of all the things one can say about John, he's, it's very often, um, he's very often praised and rightly so. I think that's one of the most um, distinct aspects of John Hume's personality, the, the way in which he would think things through and come to a very clear-headed analysis. Uh, of, the, of the issues. So why John Hume in America, or maybe it should have been John Hume in Boston, but why, 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 why did I get involved in John Hume in America? Very briefly, there have been biographies of John Hume, there have been doc other documentaries made about John Hume, and the focus on America I always felt was somewhat lacking because here was this leader for peace and justice who managed single-handedly to come to the United States, come to the, the House of Representatives and the, and the Senate and ultimately the White House, and not only get a hearing, but really forge uh, very strong alliances and coalitions for change and for peace in, in Ireland. And I felt that that particular dimension of uh, John Hume's political life hadn't been properly um, examined. So that's what I set out to do in this film um, and book. I've written a book on the subject too. So I think it, it, it was the, the, the missing dimension of, of John Hume's life. And um, 
With that, I think I'll just invite you, I hope, to, to enjoy the film. I would welcome your comments and questions later. I want to thank you, my organizers, my hosts, uh, once again, and all of you. First thing, John, I think the film, I'm George, I'm sorry. I think the film uh, aptly shows how Tip and Ted came into this orbit with John Hume. I'm wondering how you came into that orbit. Was it when you were Senate uh, Majority Leader, or was it before then? To, to tell us that. My father's parents were born in Ireland, uh, emigrated to the United States, and ended up in Boston just prior to 1900. My father was born here, but he never knew his parents. His uh, mother died shortly after his birth. His father couldn't care for the kids, so he was raised in an orphanage uh, where he spent several years, and then he was adopted by an elderly, childless couple from a small town in Maine where he grew up, didn't have much education, and ended up as a janitor at a local school. So he had no sense of his Irish heritage. Uh, I don't ever remember him saying a word. And of course, given the circumstances, my mother was an immigrant and she couldn't read or write. She worked in textile mills, so my parents never went anywhere. Of mine, Ireland, they didn't hardly ever got out of Maine. So I didn't have a real sense of Irish heritage uh, until I got to the Senate and I became involved through my friendship with uh, Ted Kennedy, uh, Chris Dodd, and Pat Moynihan primarily. Uh, they uh, talked to me often about it. When I first got there, I was appointed senator. They didn't talk to me at all. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't until I won an election and I became a jury. Then they talked to me a lot. Uh, and uh, uh, I sort of acquired uh, knowledge of the situation indirectly through them. Became, of course, more and more interested uh, given my father's heritage, and uh, it really came to a head uh, after I'd become majority leader and the F incidents described in the film, the nascent process, the visa application. I, at Pat's request, Pat brought the letter over to my desk with a pen just to make sure that I'd right. sign the letter. There were four of us on it at the time. When did you first meet John, John Yu? Uh, it was about that time. Mm. Uh, uh, I then, of course, uh, once I, w what happened was, I originally went at President Clinton's request to serve as the title was the President's uh, representative in Northern Ireland. The British were strongly opposed to the use of the word envoy. Prime Minister Major, who I think has received far less credit right. than he deserves that. for his role in this process, uh, was in a very awkward and difficult situation. His party was generally opposed to external participation. One of the members of the parliament said to me in, in a direct way, he said, well, if Texas tries to secede again, do you think we should send someone from Britain to try to settle? <laughs> I personally and, have no problem. And, 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 <laughs> uh, so, uh, Major, uh, 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 we Americans don't appreciate sufficiently the differences in our democratic systems between our Republican form of government and the parliamentary system. A prime minister with a large majority in the parliament has far more independent authority than any American president ever has had. A prime minister with a small majority has far less power than any president we've ever had. Mm. And 
toward the end of his term, John Major had a majority of two or three. The number of unionists in the British Parliament was substantially greater than the majority. You're seeing a similar consequence right now. now. And Major had a substantial segment of his party opposed to American participation and this reliance upon unionist members of the parliament, basically for his majority. So I, he, he got the ball rolling, mm -hmm. and he made several very courageous decisions mm -hmm. along the way. So I, I got involved. John was obviously the architect of the process, as I described right. in the film. It was his vision, his insight, so obvious in retrospect, but often great insights are obvious right. only in retrospect, that you could not resolve the relationship between unionists and nationalists in the North independent of the larger relationships, Northern Ireland and the Republic, and the Republic and the UK, that you had to have an architecture of negotiation that embraced all three. That's how we conceived the so-called three strands. And we had those discussions in parallel, same people, but different segments. And that made it all possible. John really didn't do a great deal of the actual negotiation. Seamus Mallon, who you yeah. saw briefly on the screen, he was, the chief was one of the most brilliant, detailed negotiators, orators I've ever met. Mm. He and John were a fantastic team. Uh, and the SDLP played a huge role uh, in that process, for which they ultimately have paid a very large price. But, but, but there, I, I said when the Nobel Prize was announced that there would not have been a peace process without John Hume, and there would not have ultimately been an agreement without David Trimble. Well, I'd say there wouldn't have been an agreement without George Mitchell. They should have yeah. gave a third Nobel Thank Prize if you ask me. Um, Morris. It's not as if Irish nationalism did not try to harness American political power before, um, but John seemed to figure out the calculus uh, like no one. How did he do this? Was there any influence or particular influence on him said, this is what I'm going to do, or was it as simple as I'm going to get Tip, I'm going to get Ted, I'm going to get Pat Moynihan, and I'm going to go forward? How did he figure it out? It's uh, an absurd question to ask here in Boston because uh, Sean Donnan, who features quite a bit in the, in the film, as amb in the, was ambassador in Washington before he was ambassador, he was uh, consul general, Fanula's uh, predecessor. Uh, he, he was consul general here in, in, in Boston. And during that period, uh, 69, John Hume was awarded uh, a, a, an award here in, in Boston. He came out here and he was very happy to be here. I mean, it was a very intense period, and Derry couldn't leave very long. But um, what he saw here, he got a tremendous reception, very re receptive people. But he also saw that the Speaker of the House is John McCormack. It's down in Washington. If I'm coming to the United States for three, four, five-day um, stints, I, I also need to build a Washington dimension. I remember as time went on, he got elected to also to Britain, British Parliament and, and Europe. He became just more and more busy, is my reading of the situation. And I think he felt that he really needed to make his time count when he came to the United States. That was one thing. And secondly, you did have the appetite in Washington. You've mentioned Senator Kennedy and Speaker O'Neill. They were already starting to reach out. I mean, the, the, the meeting, the first meeting is, is dealt with, there's that part of the film we didn't play, but um, when Senator Kennedy meets John Hume for the first time, it really was almost electrifying because suddenly Senator Kennedy, Kennedy's famous staff, uh, Kerry Parker and many others who were concentrated on Ireland, 
they just they got into motion and they worked with Joan Hume um, very in a very sustained manner. And Speaker O'Neill also had this appetite. You know, when Bloody Sunday happened, he instituted this, the hearings into what occurred uh, Bloody Sunday. So you had these leaders within the United States Congress who wanted to do something. They needed a touchstone. They needed a source of credibility. And Hume was their person from, from that early 70s period onwards. Um, I think he had, I mean, he was a student of history, John Hume um, in Maynooth University. And he'd seen, I think, very clearly, the, and it's dealt with somewhat in the film, leaders of Irish nationalism coming to cities all around the United States and being warmly received. But to get something of policy and legislation done, and you, you can't avoid going to Washington, D.C. It was just a, an incredibly difficult realm to, to, to penetrate from, um, be, for the reasons given that uh, there was this uh, antipathy to pro-Irish resolution, uh, resolutions. I mean, I won't go into chapter and verse, but the Fogarty resolutions in the 50s, there was, there was a, a long history of defeat and I think Hume felt he had to do something to reverse that. Well, if I could just say, sure. Kevin, uh, John Hume was a great man. He, he was a brilliant politician. He, first off, he was totally committed to his goal. Secondly, it was a truly noble goal, peace through nonviolence. Third, to ask an Irish American to get involved in peace, pushing on an open door. Right. So th there was a hunger, and he, he was tenacious. He's a powerful order, a great guy to hang around with. How many times did I hear him sing the songs that sit, sitting around a piano somewhere in, the, in a bar, an embassy, or something? Uh, he, he was a truly great man in every respect. So p people recognize that. And, and they obviously they recognized it in Northern Ireland, electing him so often. But American politicians recognized a really great practitioner of politics. Before we go to audience questions, I just want to ask George one last. I remember um, when we look back in hindsight, probably one of the most brilliant things you did tactically uh, was set the hard deadline on the Good Friday Agreement. Now, I remember having a drink with John in the Storman Hotel, and he was terrified at the, yes. that that really worried him because we knew that historically – when things fail in Ireland, there's a usually a horrible return to violence. It's yes. extreme. Did John share that with you? Was he in favor of the hard deadline? Did you talk about it with him? Uh, ultimately, but let me back up a bit. I just said what a great man John was, but he's human. He made mistakes. Hmm. Uh, John was very angry at me when we did, I did the first assignment, which was at the request of the British and Irish governments to review the issue of decommissioning of weapons. And with my colleagues, Prime Minister Holkery of Finland and General de Chastain from Canada, we conceived of kind of a way around the issue. Mm. But a central concern was that the unionists insisted on an election to elect delegates to a what was called the forum, uh, a a, an assembly for discussion, the membership from which would be drawn the negotiators. And John was adamantly opposed to the election, and the unionists made it very clear they wouldn't participate at all without an election. So we tried, as always, to put things in that both sides could like, and John accepted gratefully the things that he liked, but he was very angry, and he and Seamus came to see me, and were very direct in their criticism. Uh, later, when we got to the issue that you raised, yes, he expressed his concern, but what happened was it was out of desperation. Uh, the process was failing. Uh, the British and Irish governments had moved the talks to London in January of that year. It was a terrible, bitter week of recrimination, hostility, anger, invective, zero progress actually regression. We then moved to Dublin in February. Worse, we, we evicted Sinn Féin from the talks. Sinn Féin sued me 
as to uh, trying to get my decisions that they didn't like reversed. On the flight from Dublin to New York, I concluded that the process was spiraling into failure. Remember, uh, two week, uh, in December of the previous year, December 27, Billy Wright, a unionist, loyalist paramilitary, had been murdered in prison by a group of Catholic prisoners. That touched off a tit for tat. Mm -hmm. The assassinations were occurring regularly. So I decided this process, we'd been at it now for two years, couldn't possibly succeed. We had to have a hard deadline. John was very worried about it. The British and Irish civil servants, brilliant men and women who I, I think also deserve a lot of credit, were adamantly opposed to it. They had spent their lives mm -hmm. trying to keep a lid on the conflict and keep the process going. And so they feared a failure would produce a huge outbreak of violence, but far more savage than ever before. And they expressed those concerns. However, any one of them could have vetoed it. Right. And I went to each party, 10 political parties, and to the two governments. And ultimately, I met with John and Seamus and Mark Durkin and others of their colleagues. And I told them that I've got the two governments on board. I've got the unionists on board. You guys have got to come on board. We've got to do this. And so they finally agreed, although he had tremendous reservations about it. I'm sure. I'm going to open up to questions from the audience now. There are two microphones here. Is there something in the overflow room, too? I'll just go. Yes, ma'am. And, and please keep it to a question. Absolutely. <laughs> I, my name's Ellen Kagan. and I came up from Cape Cod to see all you guys. It's it. just a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you. Um, it's very inspiring, and I'm wondering how we can apply this now because of the Mideast, North Korea. Is, is any of this possible to, to bring about this kind of peace in the world? That's up your alley, George. I did. I did yeah. I, I did, I did, She's worried about, you're talking about North Korea? I'm, ta I'm talking about the whole world, North Korea, the Mideast. I mean, what you did in Ireland is so inspiring. Can we apply can it to North Korea or the Mideast or whatever today? Uh, Having, after I left Northern Ireland, I went to the Middle East uh, for two tours of duty, and I had previously spent a good bit of time in the Balkans. Uh, and while all conflicts share some similarities, uh, I believe each is unique, uh, just as each human being is unique, and that it's very difficult to uh, formulate a solution. You, you can formulate and standardize processes and procedures and attitudes, but uh, they're so different that each uh, conflict, I believe, requires a unique uh, uh, solution dedicated to the precise circumstances, both historical and in t current time and place. We, we were very lucky. Uh, I, I've thought about this often. We came this close to not succeeding in Northern Ireland. It took a lot of courage, mainly by the people you saw on the screen, John, uh, Seamus, Sinn Féin, the Unionists, and it took Dr. Paisley sure. coming around Eventually. at the end as well. Better late than never. Series of improbable events. So I, I, I wish there were, I wish I could say I think there is some formulation, but uh, I think other than the general attitude, the real spirit that John pointed out that Dialogue between serious people can resolve issues no matter how ancient and how difficult. But if you don't have a serious intent on all sides, uh, it's very difficult. So you don't think you could have tweeted an end to the conflict in Northern Ireland? <laughs> <laughs> Worth a try. Well, could, could I, uh, uh, I spent five years there. Yeah, I, I wish I had known Heather. about tweets. I may have been able to shorten that by a couple of years. Kevin, sure. Kevin, I just quickly, oh, sure. briefly add, um, Jerry Adams has an article in The Guardian today about Catalonia, the situation there, and how suddenly it spiraled into violence and uh, chaos and division. And what he's advocating is uh, people listening to each other, non-violent approach, constitutional approach, and so on. And when I was reading it, uh, it brought to my mind uh, a late interview John Hume gave close to his retirement from politics in which he said political leadership is about imparting a new language 
I think the degree to which someone like Jerry Adams has absorbed that uh, language of dialogue and reconciliation and the need to uh, listen is truly remarkable. But I agree certainly with the Senator that so many, there are so many different facets to, um, to areas of division, even I mean Catalonia thankfully isn't in a, in a war zone as yet, but still I think by looking, one of the core um, approaches could be just simply look at the history of the place. And that's an example that Joan Hume gave, look at the history of the North to see where the solution could lie. And, and I will say, there aren't many John Humes. Mm -hmm. uh, Harry Truman was once asked about the theory of communism, which was that there are large economic impersonal forces that make history, not people. And Truman replied in the jargon of the day, men make history, not the other way around. Mm. And John Hume made history. Well and said. there aren't many of him around in many other places today. Over there. Uh, what? This is extremely impressive, and I want to thank Mr. Fitzmaurice for his uh, um, blending of the culture and the music and the scenery with the harsher aspects of, and again, congratulations on a masterpiece. And my question would be to you, and I have a question for each of the other two gentlemen. Um, will this be on Netflix? <laughs> you bet. Uh, I, I'd love if it would get on. I mean, I think a lot of filmmakers share this objective. What wants the, the work to be seen and to be discussed in fora like this. And Netflix has um, become a great uh, medium for people to, all over the world to see a film. Um, <laughs> It's not a, the way Netflix operates, they come and knock on your door rather than vice versa. <laughs> and in fact, I was just in Los Gatos, California over the weekend, that's, that's where they're based. So <clears throat> they haven't knocked on my door yet. But then this, this film is just it really in its infancy. Very few people have, have seen it as yet. And um, yeah, p possibly. Excellent. Uh, yes, my, my I had two, two questions left. One was for uh, Kevin Cullen. Uh, congratulations on being a counterbalance to the propaganda from London, which tended to shape everything because they're so brilliant at uh, dominating the English language, although they get lessons from the Irish from time to time and how to use it through the poets, Seamus Heaney, Yeats, and so forth. Um, and I want you to keep up the great work and enlightening us in this uh, fake news era. And to Senator Mitchell, uh, I believe and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the uh, first uh, uh, mention of a U.S. envoy was a proclamation in the presidential campaign of Senator Gary Hart uh, proposing a U.S. envoy and all party talks, those two key elements. In other words, no banning of any voices. And that came to fruition uh, with you as the envoy for President Clinton in the mid-90s. And ironically, President Trump has recently stated, maybe by tweet or otherwise, that Senator Hart would be the last envoy. Can you comment on that? I, I didn't get the full comment. He's uh, basically he's saying that Trump is, is not going to appoint another U.S. envoy to Ireland. And what do you think of that? Uh, well, well, I I hope that an envoy is appointed. Uh, I think it's important psychologically for the people of Northern Ireland to know that uh, their lives and their future are important to the United States. One could argue rationally, as Secretary Tillerson has, that we have too much of a proliferation of envoys that we have to go back and standardize the process, and that's not an irrational argument. Uh, but I do think that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, each circumstance requires a particular solution and attention, and, and I hope the administration will reconsider and appoint someone. Uh, it isn't that uh, uh, the circumstances are not the same. Uh, you have to adapt to the changes, and most of which are positive. Nonetheless, uh, uh, while there is peace, as defined as the absence of violence. There is not yet 
integration or hmm. reconciliation in the society. Years ago, I visited a small town on the Bosnia-Croatian border. It had been half Serb and half Croat before the war there. The Serbs initially gained the advantage and destroyed most of the buildings owned by Croats. The tide of war changed. The reverse occurred, and by the time I got there, almost every building in town had been damaged or destroyed. And I, I asked the young mayor, when do you think Serbs and Croats will again be able to live together in peace in your town? And he said, we will repair our buildings long before we repair our souls. Mm -hmm. It is changing what's in people's hearts and minds that is so important. That's a generational process. It has not yet occurred in Northern Ireland. And so I don't think any of us can regard the task as complete. Next April 10th will mark 20 years. And 20 years of peace is of great importance. And to me, it's great fulfillment. But the effort for peace is never ending. And I think it is important enough that an American has the responsibility of conveying to the people of Northern Ireland that we do care, we are with you, we support you. And if I could add as well that there was a moment, this is in the, the Senator Ted Kennedy oral history, there was a moment when Senator Kennedy and Tip O'Neill went to Ronald Reagan and said, well, it would be a good idea if we sent a special envoy and uh, President Reagan wasn't having it. I think it took a lot of effort on the parts of, of, of people like uh, Senator Kennedy and Speaker O'Neill and John Hume, but it also took the stars to align. I mean, someone like President Clinton to say, yeah, we're going to go with this. And I'm going to, and, uh, you know, yeah. he, he picked a very prominent politician at the time, and, he's, and he did that also with the view or the agenda to send a signal that I'm serious about this. That's, that's it. Those are the words he used to me. He said that to me. He said, I really am serious about wanting to do something here. He said, you are the retiring Senate Majority Leader. He said, if you go, people will believe that I'm serious. But he also said to me, just five months. <laughs> you should have told Heather that. I did. But, uh, I'm sorry we only have, I'm getting a signal over there. We only have time for one more question, so, so you're up. So, I grew up in Derry, and I, I think in the 60s, I liked John Hume and hated him. In the 70s, early 80s, and back to liking him again. But my question is, this peace process that John, the, the journey John Hume went through, how much of it do you think it damaged his party, the SDLP, and it, did you see today how the LCLP is leading by Colm Eastwood? And do you think his vision has damaged his party or maybe let Sinn Féin or Jerry Adams step in there? Uh, I don't think his vision damaged. You're saying, did the peace process ultimately lead to the, you know, the diminishing of yeah. the SCLP? Yeah. Well, so I don't think his vision per se damaged his party, but I think President Clinton is exactly correct in his analysis there towards the end of the film that um, once you create this structure where in Stormont you have both parties and both um, tribal presences advocating a, a very strongly their own agenda, the middle ground does suffer. It's not just jo John Hume and the SDLP, uh, but it's also the UUP. They're, as you know, they, they're showing an elect, uh, electoral showing is, is down. But I think Seamus Mallon is particularly interesting on this. He makes occasional public statements, and sometimes he can be very virulent about the degree of irresponsibility and abdication from the, uh, the roles as public representatives, namely he's talking about the DUP and Sinn Féin, not from his point of view uh, remaining in, in talks and negotiations, and um, he is optimistic, and so am I. I mean, I think that uh, people want, ultimately, they want good representation, and they want, for example, to have a voice in Westminster during these, these crucial Brexit negotiations and 
Um, I think it's really important that uh, the Irish dimension is, is somehow served and heard. So, yeah, there's, there's a, been a period of damage, and, and, but I don't think it was John Hume's vision that did that. John Hume's vision, on the contrary, did a great, a great deal to secure the present structures. Well, I, I think Morris is right. I think President Clinton was right in his comment, but I would make the further comment that while well, we're focused on John Hume, actually the damage to the Else Unions was much greater. Uh, Trimble's career ended immediately in Northern Ireland uh, because of his re reaching the agreement. Uh, but I think that uh, it's a it's demonstration of two truisms. One, life is occasionally unfair, perhaps more than occasionally. And uh, however, I think history's judgment is and will be, and I'm one of the reasons I like this film for there are many reasons. One of them is that it, it makes clear the central role that John played, it, it peripheral to it, the central role that Trimble played, peripheral to the film, but uh, it makes clear to people who really uh, were principally responsible for reaching the agreement. And, and, and I should add, there were a lot of people involved who weren't mentioned in the film. No criticism of Morris. It's, it's already too long. Uh, <laughs> That's had, a good you had, had to cut out 20 minutes here tonight. But uh, you had uh, a tremendous supporting cast. Yeah, uh, uh, I mentioned earlier Seamus, mm. Mark Durkin, Sean Farron, a whole bunch of guys and, and men and women in the SDLP, in the LC, moderates in the LC Unionist Party. Uh, uh, the, the, a succession of Irish and British prime ministers uh, who, who ironically kept it from becoming partisan within their own countries and their uh, political systems. But the real heroes were all of the political leaders of Northern Ireland. I just want to close with this comment. In our country, in all democracies, it is now fashionable to ridicule and demean political leaders. And heaven knows, we know, we see it every day, there's sometimes reason for that. But the reality is, the reality is that there are moments in history when ordinary men and women, the political leaders of Northern Ireland, this is the equivalent of a state legislature in our system, men and women who had been in conflict all of their adult lives, several of whom, whom had been imprisoned for murder, attempted murder several of whom who had been shot at and were shot during our negotiations. Two of the delegates were assassinated. And yet these men and women risked their careers, their family safety, their lives. They rose to the occasion. And to me, the lesson of Northern Ireland is that it is possible for men and women to rise above their past and themselves even in moments of crisis and do the right thing for their country and for the future of their people. And that's what gives me hope. Um, with that, I apologize. I wish we had more time. It says something about John Hume that we could be here all night t talking about him and, and the, the impact he had on, on Ireland and uh, actually the rest of the world. But again, finally, I'd like you to thank Morris Fitzpatrick and also a grieving Red Sox fan, Senator George Mitchell. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you.